The statistical tests we learned in previous modules are parametric tests. We use the t-test and ANOVA to compare sample means from different populations and the Pearson correlation coefficient to measure the strength of the linear relationship between two variables. Underlying these test statistics were assumptions of a continuous scale, normality of distribution, homogeneity of variance, and linearity. Also, when using the test statistics, we were interested in obtaining an estimate of a population parameter, such as the mean mu and correlation rho. These statistical tests are referred to as parametric tests. When the assumptions for these tests are not satisfied, there are alternative tests referred to as non-parametric tests. Sometimes non-parametric tests are referred to as distribution-free tests because the distribution does not need to take a specific form. Non-parametric tests are often used when a variable is measured on a nominal or ordinal scale. An example is the nominal variable sex, where calculating a mean is nonsensical. If you wanted to know if groups differ on sex, you would not calculate the mean sex for each group. Another example is disease stage of kidney function, which is an ordinal variable. Again, comparing means between groups would not be appropriate. Whenever you have ratings, you are working with an inherently ordinal variable. Even when a variable is on an interval or ratio scale, it might not be normally distributed and thus would violate an assumption necessary for parametric tests. Sometimes variables are skewed, such as household income. The mean would not be a good representation of the center of such a distribution. Comparing groups on income, it is possible a couple of households could make a test between groups statistically significant even if the groups are mostly comparable. Another type of deviation from normality is kurtosis. For example, a leptokurtic distribution has heavy tails, and so the probability of observing a value more than two standard deviations away from the mean is greater than 0 0.05. Applying a parametric test to leptokurtic data can result in an inflated type 1 error rate. Conversely, a platykurtic distribution can result in a conservative test. Another possibility that can affect parametric tests are outliers. An outlier has an undue influence on the mean by moving the mean away from the center of the distribution and towards the outlier. For example, most APGAR scores to measure the health of a newborn are around the score of 9, but a stillborn would have a score of 0. Because of outliers, parametric tests regarding means are not best for making group comparisons. The same applies to correlation or regression, where an outlier can change the relationship between two variables. Some of the shortcomings of parametric tests mentioned in the previous two slides can be overcome with large samples. By the central limit theorem, a non-normal distribution can still have a normally distributed sampling distribution of the means. In addition, outliers have less influence when it is just one value among many. However, when the sample is small, we cannot rely on the central limit theorem. Moreover, sometimes when working with small samples, we do not know the population distribution and so cannot assume it is normal. Applying parametric tests in such situations can lead to wrong conclusions since the reported p-values are inaccurate. For example, the pictured frequency distribution is from 12 observations and does not look normal. The sample is too small to invoke the central limit theorem, and if nothing is known about the population from which the sample came from, then we don't know the behavior of the sampling distribution. The t-test in ANOVA requires data that is quantitative, and so it's not appropriate for qualitative variables. For qualitative variable, we can calculate frequencies, but we cannot calculate parameters, such as the mean and the standard deviation. For example, we can count the number of hypertensive and normotensive patients, but we can't calculate an average hypertensive.
when interest is in knowing if there is a relationship between two qualitative variables, the chi-square test is employed. A relationship would indicate the level of one of the qualitative variables occurs regularly with the level of the other qualitative variable. An example of a relationship between two qualitative variables is sex and baldness. Baldness is much more common in men compared to women. Recall to display a relationship between two quantitative variables, a scatter plot is used. While well, for two qualitative variables, a contingency table is used, which shows the number of people that possess the attribute for each of the levels of both variables. Let's go through an example. Suppose 300 people who exercise are asked what type of exercise they perform. We want to know, is there an association between sex and exercise preference? We learn of the 100 men asked, 40 perform weight training, 30 do yoga, and 30 aerobics. And of the 200 women queried, 20 use weights, 120 do yoga, and 60 aerobics. We can display these frequencies in a contingency table. In order to calculate the chi-square statistic, we need to find the marginal totals. The marginal totals give the frequencies for each level of one variable, summed over the levels of the second variable. For instance, the marginal total for weights is 40 plus 20 equals 60. And so we know just focusing on the variable exercise type, irrespective of sex, 60 people in the sample prefer weights. We do this for each level of exercise type. Similarly, the marginal totals for men is 40 plus 30 plus 30 equals 100. We learn when just looking at sex, there are a total of 100 men in the sample. Lastly, the bottom right hand corner gives the total sample size. It can be found by summing the row totals or summing the column totals. Using the marginal totals and total sample size, we can find the expected number of people in each cell if the row and column variables are independent. From the marginal row totals, we see that 100 out of 300, or 33% of the sample, is male. If there is no association between sex and exercise type, then we would expect about 33% of the people who use weights, 33% of people who do yoga, and 33% of the people who do aerobics to be male. Similarly, if the variables are independent, then we would expect 67% of the people who prefer each type of exercise to be women. There are 60 people who use weights. If the number of males who use weights is proportional to the number of men in the sample, then we would expect 33% of 60, or 20 of the people who use weights to be male. Likewise, females represent 67% of the sample, and so the expected number of women who use weights, if the variables are independent, is 67% of 60, or 40 women. The previous procedure is done for every cell to find the expected frequencies assuming independence. Notice in calculating the expected cell frequencies, we take the row total and divide it by the sample size to detain the proportion of men or women, and then we multiply this by the column total to arrive at the expected cell size. This simplifies to the row total times the column total divided by the sample size. For instance, to find the expected cell frequency for women who do yoga, we multiply the row total for women, which is 200, by the column total for yoga, which is 150, and divide by the sample size, which is 300. This gives us 100, and so we would expect if there's no relationship between sex and exercise type, 100 women would prefer yoga. If the variables are truly independent, then the expected cell frequencies should be close to the actual or observed cell frequencies. On the other hand, if the variables are not independent, but rather dependent, then there will be large differences between the observed and expected frequencies. The chi-square statistic involves calculating the difference between the observed and expected frequencies.
for each cell, the difference between the observed and expected is first squared, and this squared difference is then divided by the expected cell size. The reason for this latter adjustment is so large cell sizes do not have undue influence on the statistic. Finally, these adjusted square differences are summed across all cells to arrive at the chi-square value. If there is a relationship between the two variables, then the square differences will be large, and this in turn will result in a large chi-square value. Thus, the larger the chi-square value, the stronger the evidence for an association. In our example, chi-square equals 42. The calculated chi-square is affected by the number of cells in the table. With more cells, it's easier to attain a large chi-square. So we need to take into consideration the number of cells, or degrees of freedom, since this will affect the probability of observing a specific chi-square value. The degrees of freedom is the number of cell frequencies that are free to vary given the marginal totals. In the example, we know there are 100 men, 200 women, 60 people who use weights, 150 who do yoga, and 90 who do aerobics. These are the marginal totals. Now suppose we assign the frequency of 50 for the cell men who use weights. Then the number of women who use weights is not free to vary because we know 60 people use weights. The number of women who weight train must be 60 minus 50, or 10 women. Next, suppose we assign the frequency 100 to women who do yoga. Then the frequency of men who do yoga is not free to vary. It must equal 150 minus 100, or 50 men. Now that we have the frequencies for men who use weights and do yoga, the number of men who do aerobics is not free to vary. Given that there are 100 men total, the number doing aerobics is 100 minus 50 minus 50, or 0 men. Similarly, the frequency of women who do aerobics is not free to vary and must equal 90. Thus, the degrees of freedom in this example equals 2. A general formula for the degrees of freedom for the chi-square test is the number of rows minus 1 multiplied by the number of columns minus 1. Here it is 2 minus 1 multiplied by 3 minus 1, which gives us the two degrees of freedom. Now that we know the chi-square value and degrees of freedom, we can test the hypothesis of no association. One way to do this is to compare the calculated chi-square to the critical value chi-square. The critical value can be obtained from a chi-square table. Using an alpha level of 0.05, we could see from the table that the critical value for two degrees of freedom is 5.99. The calculated chi-square of 42 is greater than 5.99, so we reject the null hypothesis of no association and conclude sex and exercise type are related. Also, the p-value is less than 0 0.001, meaning the probability of observing a chi-square of 42 or more if there was no relationship, is less than 0 0.001. The chi-square test statistic actually just approximates a chi-square distribution and works well for large samples. However, when the sample size is small, the p-value reported is not accurate. This could possibly lead to a wrong conclusion when using chi-square in situations when it is not appropriate. Assumptions for the chi-square test include no cell should have expected cell counts near zero, and the percent of cells with expected counts less than five should not exceed 20%. For example, if a contingency table contains eight cells, and two cells, or 25%, had expected cells less than five, then the chi-square cannot be trusted. In such situations, in place of chi-square, one should use an exact test. An exact test computes the probability directly of observing a particular set of frequencies in a contingency table without relying on approximation to the chi-square distribution. The Fisher exact test is most often used for a 2x2 two two table where there are four cells. 
but it can be extended to tables with more cells. But because it's easiest to understand with a 2 by 2, we'll work with such a table. Let's label the cells in the table from A to D. This will help with understanding the calculation. The statistician, R.A. Fisher, devised the test and showed the probability of a specific configuration of cell frequencies can be calculated from the hypergeometric distribution, which simplifies to the formula shown on the slide. As seen, the formula takes the factorials of the marginal totals, sample size, and cell frequencies. Let's do an example. Suppose a study of 10 patients, each receiving one of two treatments, are followed for two years, and the survival is recorded for each patient. Out of the six patients who received treatment A, five were still alive at the end of the study, while one died. Of the four patients who received treatment B, three died and one was alive. The sample is very small and the expected frequencies are below five for all four cells, so the chi-square test is not appropriate. Using Fisher's exact test, we see the probability of this particular cell frequency configuration given the marginal totals equals 0.114. However, we need to find the probabilities for more extreme tables and sum all the probabilities to arrive at the p-value. Recall a p-value tells you the probability of observing the sample data or data more extreme. For example, the p-value less than 0 0.001 from the earlier chi-square of 42 was the probability of observing a chi-square value of 42 or greater. Here, a more extreme table would be if all six people from treatment A survive. The probability of this particular configuration equals 0 0.005. And so the p-value for the test of dissociation between treatment and living status is 0.114 plus 0 0.005 equals 0.119. Since the p-value is greater than the alpha level of 0 0.05, we would not reject the null hypothesis. We cannot conclude there is a difference between treatment A and treatment B. Notice in this calculation, there is no reference to a distribution, such as z, t, or chi-square, in arriving at the p-value. The mann whitney u test is used to test the null hypothesis that there is no difference between two population distributions. Some researchers interpret this as comparing the medians between two populations. It corresponds to the t-test for independent samples without the assumption of normality or equality of variances. It is employed when the outcome variable is measured on an ordinal scale or the distribution of a continuous variable does not meet the assumptions for a t-test. The test is also referred to as the Wilcoxon rank sum test, and it can be shown that the formula for the Mann Whitney U and Wilcoxon sum are equivalent and result in the same exact p value. As an example, suppose heart rate is measured in a sample of 12 patients, and the interest is in knowing if there is a difference between males and females. Since the sample size is only 12, we cannot rely on the central limit theorem to assume normality in the sampling distribution of means, and thus a nonparametric method is used. Notice there are seven males and five females, and so, like the t-test, equal group size is not required to use the Mann-Whitney u-test. The Mann-Whitney u-test is calculated by converting scores to ranks and comparing the ranks between groups. Thus, the first step is to combine the groups and order the entire sample of scores in ascending order from lowest to highest. This is followed by placing the rank adjacent to each score. Notice by replacing scores by ranks, if there are any outliers, their influence would be reduced. For instance, if the heart rate rating of 93 was changed to 103, it would still have the same rank of 12. Next, assign the group membership to each rank. It is the ranks that are used to calculate the test statistic. Once the ranks for each group are known, the Mann-Whitney U test is calculated by summing the ranks for one group 
and testing if it differs from what would be expected if the groups were the same. If there is no difference between the groups, we would expect the mean ranks between groups to be about the same. The Mann-Whitney test approximates a standard normal distribution, and so the z-test is used to obtain a p-value. In this example, the mean rank for males is 8.71, and the mean rank for females is 3.4. If there truly is no difference in heart rate between males and female patients, then the probability we could sample 12 patients and get the observed mean ranks is only 0 .012 according to the test statistic. Since this p-value is below the alpha level 0 .05, we reject the null hypothesis of similar distributions and conclude males have higher heart rate than females. The man with EU test is a non-parametric analog to the independent samples t-test. There are other non-parametric tests that correspond with parametric tests used for comparing means. When the assumptions for analysis of variance for comparing three or more groups do not hold, one can use the non-parametric Kruskal-Wallis test instead. In place of the pair t-test for dependent samples, the non-parametric Wilcoxon sign rank test can be used. And similarly, when the assumptions for the repeated measures ANOVA are not valid, the non-parametric Freeman test can be used in its place. For all these non-parametric tests, the procedure is similar to how the Man whitney u was calculated. The original scores are converted to ranks, and the ranks are compared between groups. The test statistic approximates a distribution, such as the z or chi-square distribution, and the p-value is obtained from the distribution. Recall the Pearson correlation coefficient measures the strength of the linear relationship between two continuous variables. Sometimes a researcher encounters situations when the two variables are not on a continuous scale, or the distribution of at least one of the variables is not normal or contains outliers. In such circumstances, the Pearson correlation may not give a good estimate of the relationship between the two variables. A better measure is the Spearman-Rank correlation. The Spearman-Rank correlation converts the scores from each of the two variables into ranks and then applies the Pearson correlation to the transformed ranks. It is a measure of the linear relationship between the rank scores, or you can think of it as a measure of consistency between the two variables. Like the Pearson correlation, the Spearman rank ranges from negative 1 to positive 1, where values close to negative 1 or positive 1 indicate a strong re relationship, and values near 0, no relationship. Let's look at a simple example. Suppose in 8 male patients, body mass index and testosterone level measured in picograms per milliliter was measured. The parametric Pearson correlation between the two variables equals negative 0.8, and the linear relationship is deemed statistically significant since p is less than 0 0.05. However, a scatter plot of the two variables shows there is an outlier in the upper left corner in the figure. This outlier, which is patient 1, is distorting the relationship between the variables and causing the Pearson correlation to be inflated. If we ignore that patient, notice the relationship between BMI and testosterone for the remaining seven patients does not appear as strong. This is a good situation to use the Spearman rank correlation. To calculate the Spearman correlation, first the scores for each variable are converted to ranks. Similar to the Man whitney u test, by converting to ranks, Scores that were originally outliers are no longer far removed from the other scores. Notice the testosterone score for the first patient. The value of 11.97 is much higher than the second highest value of 7.31 observed for patient 5. When converted to ranks, the first patient has a rank testosterone score of 8, while the fifth patient has a rank score of 7, and the ranks are closer together. After converting the variables to ranks, the next step is to perform the usual Pearson correlation on the rank scores. In the example, the Spearman R equals negative 0 0.64.
which is smaller than the Pearson R of negative 0.8 applied to the original variables. Also, the relationship is no longer statistically significant since P is above 0 0.05. When we look at the scatter plot of the transformed ranks, we no longer see the outlier and the relationship does appear weaker than the scatter plot that was used for the original values. The SPSS output on the left shows the Spearman rank correlation of negative 0.643 and the p-value of 0.086. Notice the variable names BMI and testosterone. To demonstrate the Spearman correlation is just the Pearson correlation applied to rank data. The output on the right shows the Pearson correlation for the transformed ranked variables. Notice the variable names now include rank. It gives the same correlation in p-values as the Spearman rank correlation. The previous non-parametric tests that compared groups invoked the chi-square or z-distribution for hypothesis testing. The distribution of ranks asymptotically approaches those parametric distributions and it was assumed the approximation was close enough for the test to be valid. For exact tests, the sampling distribution is known exactly, and there is no need to rely on asymptotic properties. When the samples are very small, and the approximation of the previous non-parametric test cannot be trusted, the exact test is recommended. Pisser's exact test shown earlier is one example of an exact test. As an example, suppose we want to compare males and female students on test scores and the sample size is only five people. Without knowing the form of the population distribution, the sample is much too small to use the parametric t-test. And with only five observations, it is still too small to use the non-parametric Mann-Whitney u-test because the distribution of ranks cannot be assumed to be normal. Thus, we are left with an exact test. Looking at the scores, we see the first student had the highest score and is female. The second student had the lowest score and is male, and so forth. The idea behind the exact test is to enumerate every possible sample that can be generated given the number of people from each group in the observed scores. We then find what proportion of these generated samples is equal to or more extreme than the actual one observed. So to carry out the exact test, the scores are ordered in descending order without regard to group membership. Then the possible samples are enumerated. One possible sample is that the two highest scores are from females and the three lowest scores come from males. Another possible sample is that the highest score is from a female and the second highest score is from a male. Then the third highest score is a female followed by the two lowest scores coming from males. We have now generated two possible samples given the observed data and group sizes. This continues until we have generated every possible sample. It can be shown that for a sample of five people with two people in one group and three in the other group, there's a total possibility of 10 different samples. All the possible different combinations are listed in the table and vary from the first sample, where the two females have the highest score, to the tenth sample, where the two females have the lowest scores. We next find where the actual observed sample falls in this distribution of all possible samples. In the observed sample, the two highest scores did come from females. The proportion of samples that are equal to or more extreme than the observed sample is 1 out of 10, and thus the p-value equals 0 0.10. However, this was not a directional alternative hypothesis, and so the p-value needs to be multiplied by 2 to give the correct p-value for a two-tailed test. Of note, the number of possible samples in the sampling distribution quickly increases as the sample size gets larger. For instance, if there were two groups of 10 people each for a total sample size of 20, the number of possible samples is 184,756. Fortunately, 
we can rely on parametric or non-parametric tests when the sample increases in size.